Good morning. It is, uh, it's good to be back on this stage and uh, sharing from God's Word with you. If you have uh, read this week, which I hope you have ahead of time, uh, we are in the book of Ruth, and so you can open your story Bible to around page uh, 120, a little after that. Uh, if you have your Bibles as well this morning, I encourage you to open to the book of Ruth. Uh, this morning, before I get started, I just want to let you all know in second service that Lincoln Johnson was baptized this morning, and we got to celebrate that in our first service um, and so that was an exciting moment this morning. And that's a good reminder that for those of us who have not made a decision to follow Jesus, and maybe during this uh, pandemic, there's been that kind of thinking about uh, eternal things and God's gotten a hold of your heart or you're wondering what your next step is. Something we'd love to talk with you about if you have any interest is about baptism. And that's something we can always do on Sunday mornings here um, or find a time during the week if that's uh, better for you at this time. And so feel free to reach out to me or to our our staff, we'd love to find a time to study more with you, to talk more with you, and to have all of us make that decision to follow Jesus in that important way. Let us pray as we open God's Word uh, this morning. Father, I thank you for the story of Ruth and for its simplicity and for its challenge and for its blessing. And God, I pray today as we come to this story that it would not just be a story from the past of what you've done in the past, but it would be a reminder of who you are today and what you call us to in this moment. And this morning, I pray you would pour through me the gift of preaching so that Christ would be formed in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that we, we all pray. And God's people said, amen. Well, I notice in my life that a lot of the disappointment that I deal with is because of false expectations that I have had about how life should go or about who God is or about how relationships should work out or whatever it may be. Expectations have a lot to do with disappointment. In fact, this is one of the, the first things I talk about and most important things I talk about when I'm counseling a couple that's walking into marriage and premarital counseling is it's really important to understand what your expectations are because things are often different as we walk into uh, relationships that we walk with on a daily basis in that way. Uh, I thought my family was normal growing up until I got married. Because when I got married, I realized that, wait, there's a whole other way of doing things that I had no idea that other families had. I thought our way was the only way. It was the normal way. On Sunday afternoons, on a Sunday such as this, on Master Sunday, we would be in front of the television watching the Masters. That's just what you do on Sunday afternoons. And Holly actually put it to good use because she started napping on Sunday afternoons uh, watching golf. So it, it worked out, but we had to figure out ways that we were going to work together differently. Uh, fantasy football was something that was just a norm in our house. On Saturday nights, you put the right players in, you make sure you have no buys on your team. And I found out that Holly's family didn't do that growing up. Uh, you can fill in the blank yourself. As you walk into marriage, there's this realization that different families do things different ways. Thanksgiving looks a little different. When do you open the gifts? Is it Christmas Eve or is it Christmas morning or whatever it is? And, and part of a good marriage is coming to realize that, yes, there's some good things to take from our family of origin, but there's some things that we can actually do better as we find life together and strike out on our own. But this isn't only about uh, marriage. It's true in all of life. I mean, how many of you have expected to live a life full of health until you died warm in your bed and an easy transition to the afterlife. That sickness wouldn't be a part of the journey that you walked through or your spouse walked through. Uh, that's kind of our expectation, I think, unless we grew up maybe in a house where sickness was just around all the time. How many of us expected that the relationship we were in would go on forever until we got that call or that bit of news that was a challenge to the relationship? How many of us expected for the journey to have children after marriage would be an easy transition, but we found that for some of us, that's, it was a larger challenge than the stories we'd heard growing up about how you have kids and, and the order of things and how it goes. We could talk about all kinds of expectations, and sometimes when those expectations aren't met, we place our frustration on God because God hasn't come through in the ways we thought that God was supposed to. Now, if you've ever experienced the death of a dream or an expectation in your life, today's story, I think, speaks directly to you in those situations. And so maybe right now, as I look out, just seeing the masks on faces is a reminder that things are not what we expected to be in this season uh, at this time last year. And so we have to rework our expectations, but realize that God is there even in the midst of disappointment in all those situations. This is true in the story of Ruth. In fact, before we get to Ruth, we need to talk about Naomi. Naomi is the central character as we open this story. She was a woman who had a dream for how life would go. 
She would get married. She would have kids, preferably some sons along the way, so the name, family name could be carried on in those days. And she would live a long life. And things are on track early in this story. She got married to a wonderful man named Elimelech. She has two sons with rhyming names that I'm sure she planned growing up, uh, Malon and Kilion. If you're looking for baby names, there's a couple for you that I don't hear too often. I bet they probably had a dog named Moses too, right? I mean, this is the perfect Hebrew family. And Naomi's name should tell us something about the start of her life. Her name in Hebrew means sweet or pleasant. Life was good for Naomi. And maybe some of you can remember back in moments in your life, or maybe right now it feels like that. You're just in this sweet spot of a moment in your life, and things seem so sweet. Things seem as you would expect them to be. And that was true in this story until there was a famine in the land. Now, when we talk about famine, sometimes we think about droughts or something like that in America. That's not what we're talking about here. This is a famine of biblical proportions. And if you think back in the story of Israel before this moment, as we've read the story together, there was another moment where a famine came into play. And that moment was uh, with the family of Jacob. When Joseph is sold by his brothers into slavery, he ends up in Egypt and he says there's going to be seven, he interprets this dream to say there's going to be seven years of plenty and there's going to be seven years of not enough, of famine. And sure enough, Joseph's brothers end up showing up to Egypt because they don't have enough to go around. And so the people of God end up in Egypt as a result of a famine. And that all seems good until the years that follow, 400 years of slavery that they end up in a place they would have never imagined. No, famine was not a good thing for the people of Israel. It reminded them of difficult moments in their past. And so in this story, a famine happens And Naomi decides with her husband, Elimelech, that they're going to leave Bethlehem, the land they've known, and they're going to go to Moab. And Moab's not a beautiful place in the desert of Utah, right? Moab, for them, is this place where the enemies live, the Moabites. You remember how the background on the Moabites, about how they came into being? Uh, They actually came from a really difficult story that we touched on a little bit in the story earlier. They descended from um, an encounter between an inebriated Lot and his daughters, if you remember that story. They came from a a mixed and sordid background and origin. Not a highlight in the story. And the Moabites, they worshipped another god named Chemosh. And Chemosh involved in worship there with self-mutilation and temple prostitution and child sacrifice. No Israelite would have considered moving to Moab unless things had gotten really, really bad. And that's exactly what had happened. The famine had gotten so bad that uh, Naomi and her family moved there. And her sons uh, met and married uh, Moabite women, uh, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. Now, remember, God had specifically commanded the Israelites that they were not to intermarry with these other nations because God wanted them to not be led away to, to worship other gods. But here she finds herself with these sons who've married these Moabite daughter-in-laws. She was at the bottom of society because in the story as it goes on, we find out that her husband dies and then her sons die. And so she's left with these two daughter-in-laws from another place. Now, it's easy to read right past this in the story of Ruth and want to get to the positive parts, the exciting parts where God shows up. But I want you to stay here just for a moment with Naomi in this difficult moment as she's trying to decide how to move forward with the deaths she's experienced trying to figure out what life can look like going forward. Some of you can relate to this, a dream turning into a nightmare. All of our lives can fall apart with just a mere phone call, can't they? Maybe a call about the relationship and what your spouse has done, or dismal diagnosis, or a job review that ends up in being fired. Any number of things can take you from that dream, that light, into the darkness. Nobody expects for that call to come, for their life to get turned upside down. But that's exactly what had happened to Naomi. Things have gotten so dark that when Naomi decides uh, what she's going to do, she decides she's going to move back to Bethlehem to put her life back together. And when she gets back, the people in Bethlehem don't even recognize Naomi. I'm going to read from page 122 in the story. You can turn to Ruth chapter 1, verses 19 and following. Listen to this, how bad it's gotten. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. 
Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Now, as I said earlier, Naomi is this wonderful name. It means sweet and pleasant. But what she says when she comes back is, don't ever call me that again because life is not that way. Call me Mara. It means life is bitter. She feels as if God has forsaken her. Have you been there before? We're going to almost change your name because the fortunes have turned so much. When she chose to return to Bethlehem, she begged her daughter-in-laws, why don't you stay where you're at? Stay in Moab. Maybe you can find a husband here because your husbands have died. And in one way, I think she's trying to be merciful to these women. But I think there's actually more to this story. Because what would it look like if Naomi returned uh, to two Moabite daughter-in-laws coming along with her back home? It would have been proof of the disobedience that her sons had engaged in. Orpah finally takes Naomi's advice. She says, okay, well, if you insist, I'll stay home and stay behind. But Ruth, she can't seem to shake Ruth. In fact, one of the most famous passages in the book of Ruth, if you remember anything if, from reading the story growing up, it may just be these verses. It's Ruth's insistence. I'm not going anywhere to Naomi. Listen to this from uh, Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. This may be a passage you've heard read at a wedding before. It's one of the more popular verses. It's this insistence that no matter what happens in life, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to be by your side, which is a beautiful thought, right? In fact, I had a friend who planned on actually inscribing this verse on the ring for uh, his wife uh, when it came to the wedding as a reminder of the commitment he was making. Unfortunately, he got the wrong verse. Instead of Ruth 1, 16 and 17, he put uh, Ruth 2, 16 and 17, which is an interesting commitment to make. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. Maybe that's another message that he wanted to send his wife. I don't know. But it's a reminder, right, of getting the right verse. This is an important verse. I'll go with you wherever you go. But this is one of the most out-of-context verses in the entire Bible because it's one thing to, to commit to your spouse in front of them and vowing, where you go, I will go. Where you st it's another thing at the wedding to turn around to your mother-in-law and to actually make those commitments to her. That's what Ruth is doing. Not just at the wedding ceremony, but after her husband is gone. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. It's an, uh, uh, it's an amazing commitment. Because a Moabite woman in Bethlehem is putting herself in great danger. When she goes to pick up the leftover grain in these fields... She's depending on this God of Naomi to somehow take care of her. And the wonderful thing about the Torah, the first five books, the law, is there's this commitment, there's this law in the Old Testament that says to all the Israelites who have fields, you're to leave at the edges of the fields grain, leftover food, for those strangers who may wander in. And so, actually, there's a law that's preparing for this very moment for people like Ruth. So Ruth goes to the field to find the excess crops, and it's interesting, if you've read this week, that there's several times throughout the story that Boaz says to Ruth, I will make sure that no one lays a hand on you. Ruth is a despised woman in Israelite territory, and her chances of getting remarried are slim because the laws say you're not to marry these foreigners. But Ruth just happens to pick up grain in the field of just the right man, a man named Boaz, a man of standing in Israel from the clan of Elimelech, Naomi's deceased husband. And Boaz does everything he can to make sure that Ruth is protected and cared for. And at the end of the story, Boaz agrees to marry Ruth. But there's one problem in the story. Because the law says that the one who is closest of kin uh, to the one who's lost her husband is the one who's to make sure she's cared for. And there's one man who's closer than Boaz. 
So Boaz goes to this other man, he finds him, and he asks him if he wants to redeem Naomi's uh, land. And the guy says, sure, more land, that sounds great. But then Boaz says, oh yeah, there's one more thing. If you want the land, you're going to have to require Ruth, the Moabite. I know he emphasized that part, right? And he says, no, you can have the land. So Boaz ends up taking in Ruth and, and redeems Ruth. Now, a couple questions I want to just kind of draw on as we close this morning. The first is this. Why do you think this story winds up in the Bible? I mean, if you look around this book in the Bible, there's stories about all of Israel, about stories about what God's doing with the whole group. This is just kind of narrowed in on one particular family. Why this family? Why this story? There's no miracles in this story. There's no Red Sea crossing. There's no, it's just kind of a normal story about this kind of small family in the midst of Bethlehem. But a second question I want to leave you with as well that I want to dwell on for a moment, that is why did Boaz care so much for Ruth? And I want you to pay close attention to this point because I think there's an important principle for us to carry forward to live out in our own lives in our own time. See, no one wants to redeem Ruth. She has no value. In fact, there's part of Boaz that's, you know, keeping the kinsman redeemer uh, idea of protecting those who need it, who've had husbands pass away, but he's marrying this foreign woman, which is a problem. There's, there's actually an interesting passage on page 123 in your story Bibles. Uh, it's in Ruth chapter 2 that I'll read here in just a moment. It's worth paying attention to. It's, it's a detail that gets lost in the story, but it's crucial for understanding the power of the book of Ruth. See, Ruth has just found Boaz's field, and she finds surprising protection from this man named Boaz, and she's surprised by his kindness. It's not what she expected. Listen to what it says there in, in Ruth chapter 2, verses 10 and through 12. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz notices something about Ruth, that she's faithful, that she stays by, by Naomi after these difficult days, or Mara, as she's called at that point. But why is Boaz paying more attention than everyone else seems to? He knows that she's left her homeland and family to be loyal to Naomi, but, but why so much attention? I've got a theory that I think Scripture bears out. And, and my theory is buried in the genealogy at the end of this small book. So turn with me, if you would, to Ruth chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Listen to this list of names that we often just kind of read over and then move on in our reading. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amenadab, Amenadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. So Boaz is the great-great-grandfather of King David, right? Which means that Jesus is actually in this lineage of this story. Maybe that's part of why this story shows up. And that makes Ruth the great-great-grandmother of King David, who we'll read about in just a few weeks. But that's not the most important part of this genealogy. It's not as clear in this genealogy, but it's actually more clear in the book of Matthew as the genealogy of Jesus is read. So I want to turn there right now to Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. We'll get to this a little bit later as we come to the story of Jesus. But I want to just touch on this now because it's an important part of the story. It says there, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David, and we'll stop there at King David. So it's kind of the same genealogy there that we read just a moment ago at the, at the end of Ruth. But did you notice the detail that's in this story? Matthew mentions Ruth in Jesus' genealogy, but did you notice the other woman who's mentioned there in this genealogy. Let me read it again, beginning of verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Now, that's an important detail. Why did Boaz care so much for Ruth the Moabite? I think it's because Boaz grew up with a mother who was a foreigner as well. Remember the story of Rahab that we read about recently? 
Rahab is the one who takes in the spies in Jericho. She's the one who, who was a prostitute, actually. But she's the one who's part of the salvation that God brings to the people of Israel when the walls fall down. And she's saved with the people of Israel. And so Boaz grows up with this mother who was a foreigner who was received into the people of God. And when you live in a mixed marriage like he grew up in, right, of an Israelite and this Rahab who's been brought into the story, all of a sudden you have new and fresh eyes, don't you? Because you've heard stories about this God who receives the stranger, who receives the foreigner. And so when this woman comes into Boaz's field, it's no accident that Boaz has eyes to see Ruth. Because Ruth is a repetition of the story of what God had already done. It's an incredible story. And I want to just speak a word as we close this morning to those of you who feel like you're far on the outside of God's story. Maybe you feel like you're far from God right now or you come from a family, you've done things that you think, I'm, I, I must not be allowed into this story. No, in the genealogy of Jesus are two women. There's more than that, actually, if you read on in Matthew. But in the part I read of, of Ruth, who's a foreigner, and of Rahab, who is a foreigner. God brings them into the story. God has a track record over thousands of years of weaving people into his story that he ends up bringing Jesus out of. And I love that because that means that none of us who were once outsiders are able to say, well, I guess I'm not welcomed in. But it reminds us that even in the very genealogy of Jesus is this small clue that we can often forget that if you feel like an outsider, you need to be reminded that God's plan from the very beginning has been to bless all the nations through Abram, to bring in all into his fold. And that's why we're here this morning, isn't it? Those of us who were once far off have been brought near to the throne of God, and no one is excluded from the family of God who wants to find their way in. So this morning, uh, as we close, I just want to remind you of your place, your identity. You are welcome in this place, no matter what your history is, no matter what your family lineage says. You're welcomed here by the grace and mercy of God, and that gives us eyes to see anyone who's on the outside. And this week, my hope is if you find people who are on the margins, if you find people who are foreigners in this land, if you find people who feel as if they're distant from God, this is the very week that you're able to share with them the story of your inclusion in this story. Let's pray as we close this morning. God, I thank you for the story of Ruth which in many ways is a strange story. It's unlike the others, but it is a story that reminds us that those who are on the outside are always welcomed in. God, help us to be a church that represents the truth of Ruth's story. And help us find that truth in our own lives. For those of us who feel distant right now, that you would remind us that, God, there are Boazes all around. There are people all around us that are ready to invite us in because they have been accepted. And God, may that story be told again and again. As all of us who were once out, outsiders have been brought near, let us give that same message to others who need it this week. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.